Hey everyone, got a little late start here on this Thursday afternoon, but that's okay. I'm sure nobody minds. I hope you don't. Uh, but let's go ahead and continue talking about radio. And of course, radio is my favorite chapter. I'm a, I'm a radio guy. That's where I came up. Um, you know, some of you can uh, look on my Facebook page and you'll see um, many pictures of when I first got into radio. I just love radio. I've always loved radio. Uh, but before we start, uh, or continue, excuse me, uh, talking about the chapter, I did want to show you this. Uh, the new radio ratings just came in. I don't know if you guys can see that, how clear it is. Okay. So the new radio ratings are out for the New York City market. Okay. Now, as you can see, New York City is the number one radio market in America. And it's got a population of a little over 16 million. Uh, it's breakdown of black and Hispanics. And then, as you can see, uh, for the month of September, uh, the number one radio station in New York, uh, again, was uh, CBS FM 101.1. Uh, I give them a lot of credit. Um, I'm not a huge fan myself of uh, Scott Shannon, but boy... Since the 80s, he has had great success in New York City Radio, and he is the morning guy and the programmer, and they are just kicking some serious butt. As you can see, Q1043 is second, Light FM is third, Mega is fourth, BLS is fifth, Hot 97 is sixth, it looks like uh, PAT is seventh, um, and then WINS is eight, um, WXNY, I think that's 92.3. Uh, and then there's KTU, and then WNEW FM rounds out uh, the list. And of course, there are other stations that are uh, on the list. They just rank lower. Um, but that's your brand new radio ratings. And, you know, it, it, it's really important, those ratings to the radio stations, to show how many people are actually listening. Um, and you can see there's a wide variety uh, of different formats. Um, you know, one of the, your, your assignment was to give me at least four stations with uh, four different formats, uh, because in New York City, there's a lot of different formats. Uh, although you do have some stations of the same format, it can become very competitive, uh, but there are a lot of different ones, and we had quite a variety there. Um, but I have to tell you, for a couple of the stations that have just been so successful over the years, uh, CBS FM and Light FM. As a matter of fact, Light FM being third is huge. Uh, because Light FM, for, God, I think 17 years that I've been teaching this course, had been number one. And, of course, you know what Light FM is. That's, that's you know, Celine Dion and Rod Stewart and every ballad by, what, what's the skinny girl's name again? Um, the one who always gets the guys breaking up with her. Uh, anyway, um, she's got all her, her ballads on there. And, you know, it's that music that you typically hear if you walk into like a doctor or dentist office or in an elevator, you know, light FM. And you have to have you have to have that throaty voice. Another 10 in a row with Valerie Smaldone. That's the DJs. Um, but it's been incredibly successful that they've now fallen to third uh, is pretty interesting to see. Uh, but still in the New York market, if you're third, that's still not bad. So um, that's your radio rating. So let's go ahead and continue. Uh one of the things I did want to first uh, talk about, going back a little bit to the 1920s, uh, radio, of course, becomes huge. The idea that in 1919, thanks to that kid David Sarnoff, the Radio Corporation of America was now producing all these radio receivers, as was Emerson and other companies, that you could have a radio in your home. And that's how you can be, you know, uh, entertained, which people absolutely loved. The problem was that as all these radio stations pop up all over the country, somebody failed to tell them that, you know, radio is pretty expensive. Now, this is a picture of a station from the 1930s uh, in Milwaukee, uh, the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's expensive. As a matter of fact, a radio station in the 1920s, in the 1920s, probably had a higher electric bill for the month than your entire family has had at your house for the last five years. I mean, that's there's a lot of electricity. If you're on 24-7, that's a lot of electricity. So, uh, you know what? If you've got a radio station that you're putting all that electricity out there, especially as everybody was trying to stay at 50,000 watts, and you have to also provide the talent. Remember, in the 1920s, that you know sound recordings weren't really there yet. 
you know, I showed you the little clip from, uh, or I wanted to show you the little clip, from, I, I think I did, from uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, the one with George Clooney, and it shows the, you know, ceramic record being laid, you know, being made. Um, it just wasn't huge. And if you had a radio station, the talent would actually have to come to your station. So because it was so expensive, they radio had to be operated in a different manner. I'm going to have to get my glasses here when I get to the next one here. So somebody came up with an idea. And they said, listen, radio is expensive, especially providing for all this talent. But listen, I've got all the money. I'm in New York City. It's where all the talent is, because in the middle 1920s, uh, especially for radio, you know, you had Broadway, you had uh, 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 vaudeville, okay? Uh, anything that had to do with the Remember, movies at the time were silent, so the people who could talk were in New York. And this guy said, listen, here's what we'll do, since I have all this money. I'll provide the talent. And then your stations, whether you're in Milwaukee, Detroit, Chicago, Dallas, Des Moines, Iowa, Seattle, Iowa, wherever you are, you carry my signal. You bring my station or my talent, my shows to your radio station. You sell the advertising and we split the profits. And in 1926, 1927, we see the birth of the first ever radio broadcast network. And that, of course is the National Broadcasting Company, also known as NBC. And that was all done by, yeah, you guessed it, David Sarnoff. David Sarnoff is literally the godfather of broadcasting. Remember, 1912, he's sitting as a 21-year-old. Suddenly, he hears signals coming from up in Greenland, Nova Scotia, Massachusetts, that the Titanic has gone down. He sits at his uh, radio post for over 50 hours. Becomes a household name in America for doing that. In 1919, he's part of the group that starts RCA. And in 1921, he became the general manager. So now in 1926, he begins and starts up the first ever broadcast network, the NBC Radio Network. As a matter of fact, some of you have probably heard it before. Uh, if you're watching, like, say, Sunday Night Football, or you happen to be watching, like, Chicago uh, Chicago Fire or one of the other shows, um, you'll hear NBC play that doom, doom, doom. They keep that symbolically as a tribute to David Sarnoff because when he started the NBC Radio Network, all the affiliates would be playing his, you know, he would have the talent in New York City. He'd have the Benny Goodman Orchestra or he'd have the Count Basie Orchestra or whatever it was. That would be funneled through wires and over the air all over the country. Your station would be playing the music he was funneling through. And then you would get time to play advertising. And then about with five seconds before the top of an hour to signal that the network was coming back on, they would send that tune, doom, 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 and then the affiliates knew, okay, NBC's coming back on the air. So that's why they symbolically keep that, and you hear that, especially if you're watching Sunday Night Football or some of the other TV uh, shows like Chicago Fire and uh, Chicago Hospital, or I don't know, there's like 65 different Chicago shows on NBC now. So that was David Sarnoff. Now, this, of course does well up until World War II. World War II, radio is still big, but of course, with the war going on, a lot of advancements can't come up. But after World War II, we see, starting around 1948, 1950, we start seeing this all over America. Yep, that of course is the lovely family now sitting down to watch this new thing called television. So now, radio has a problem. Because, as I had mentioned last time, a lot of the talent that's on radio now goes to television. Because television is brand new. See, at the time you had movie talent and you had radio talent. Well, now we've got this newfangled thing called television. Well, we got to get talent. 
Well, movie stars could never go on a small screen. At least that's what they thought back then. Uh, but then the radio people were like, hey, I don't exactly how. I'm a little better looking than a face made for radio. So th the talent would go over to radio. So now radio's like, what do we do? Especially because up until that point, you know, radio stations would play all kinds of different programming. As a matter of fact, here's an example, okay, of what could be a typical radio day. Like at 9 a.m., you'd have a news talk show. Then at 10 o'clock would be a soap opera. Let's say uh, Days of Our Lives, which Days of Our Lives did uh, derive from a radio show. And then maybe at 11 o'clock, we have a cooking show. Then at noon, you've got, all right, we'll have some of today's pop music for an hour, but then we've got a drama show, and then another soap opera, but then from 3 to 5 p.m., we'll have children's programming, all right? And then, of course, into the night, as you got uh, later into the evening, you'd have radio uh, would have, like, news or, or music, a lot of music live. You know, you'd have uh, the Glenn Miller Orchestra live from the ballroom of the Hotel Pennsylvania in New York City, um, and that's what they would have. But they would have all kinds of different programming. Well, now with all this talent gone, people are thinking, oh, my God, radio's dead. Radio's dead. What's going to happen to radio? Well, something had to save it. And that's where we talked about this uh, a, a week ago, where the sound recording industry walked in and said, hey, listen, you know, we started developing this stuff. Maybe you've seen it. Yeah, it's called these vinyl records. Okay. And we really want to sell them. And what you basically had, which still exists today, very much so today, this is formed right after World War II, and it still exists today, is that bond between radio and the sound recording industry. Because that's what saved radio, is now you had all these radio stations that were playing soap operas, action adventure shows, sports talk, news, whatever they were playing. Now everybody is going to play recorded music. But now, wait a minute. We can't have everybody playing contemporary hits or top 40 stuff. How are we going to decide who's going to play what? Well, that's where this guy comes in. And this is a guy from Texas. He was a programmer by the name of Gordon McClendon. What Gordon McClendon comes up with, he comes up with an idea. He says, here's what we'll do. Now, I run five stations in a cluster in Dallas, Texas. I now have one station is just news, 24-7, and that's it. I have my second station that's just country music, nobody else. My third station is jazz music, nothing else. My fourth station is classical music, nobody else, and so on and so forth. And what he brought to the American scene was format radio, okay? You know, one of the interesting things uh, about some of the stations that you guys picked, you know, some of those stations that you guys picked, they had vastly different formats than the ones they have now. You know, very different formats. Uh, as a matter of fact, WINS, 1010, Traffic on the Ones. They were a new station. They have been for decades. Yet, in the 1950s, they were the number one pop music station in New York City. As also was... Uh, you know, one of the stations that somebody I know went was WMCA, which I think is Spanish religion. Well, WMCA was also in the 50s and early 60s, a top 40 uh, music format. And as a matter of fact, their DJs were all called the WMCA good guys. Um, and I think one still exists today is like 90 something years old, uh, but very revered in the radio industry. Um, so that's where format radio began, and it still exists today. That's why, for example, if you're listening to Hot 97, okay, you're never going to hear a Garth Brooks song. The same way is that if you put on Light FM 106.7, you're never going to hear Drake. All right, uh, You have your different formats. Um, as a matter of fact, it's always interesting when a song comes along that can just cross so many different formats. Uh, probably the best one I've ever seen uh, was in 1999 when the legendary, legendary rocker Carlos Santana teamed up with the uh, lead singer of Matchbox 20 for the song Smooth. Well, that single, which that album I think sold like 18 or 19 million copies for Carlos Santana. Um, and we're talking, this is 1999, 30 years before Carlos Santana was at Woodstock. So it tells you that's a long time for this guy to suddenly come up with the best album he's ever had. Um, 
but that t- that single I heard played on almost every radio station in New York City. Here's why. It was played on, let's say, 105 uh, or uh, what's the top 40 station? Uh, like PLJ or um, Hot 97, okay, because it was dance because of Matchbox 20 because you could dance to it. Um it was played on Q1043, Classic Rock, because not only was Santana a classic rocker, but they called this a new classic. It was played on Spanish radio stations because it was Carlos Santana. I mean, it was just played on almost every radio station. You could go up and down the dial at any given point during the day, and at least five stations were playing Smooth by Santana and the singer from Matchbox 20. Um, that's about it. You're not going to hear many songs. Uh, but yeah, that's, it was Gordon McClend- uh, McClendon who came up with Format Radio. Now, the interesting part about radio, as it starts to take off, is now that the sound recording industry is going to team up with radio. Okay? We're going to work together, but guys, we're going to work together. And it works instantly. Radio is saved. Radio is absolutely saved thanks to its relationship with sound recordings. And, you know, a lot of records were starting to fly off the shelves because they were using radio as an advertisement. They would play the radio, the song would be played on the radio, and if young people liked it, they would go and buy it. And, of course, it was young people who were really driving radio. Well, in the mid to late 1950s, that really helped out this DJ in New York City. This is a guy by the name of Alan Freed. By 1958, he was the number one disc jockey in America. His show would be on from 7 p.m. to midnight, so all the young people would hear his show. And he would always play the most popular songs. Matter of fact, to give you an example of how popular he was, this is a poster. Here we go. Here's a poster from one of his rock and roll shows. And he used to put these rock and roll shows on all the time. And just look at some. I mean, we're talking Frankie Lyman, the Teenagers, Chuck Berry, Little Richard. Uh, I mean, Clyde McFadder. I mean, there's some big names, big, big rock and roll Hall of Fame names that are on this list. But, of course, he's the feature guy, Mr. Rock and Roll, Alan Freed. Okay. He's the guy you would go to. And what would happen was, is as his popularity grew... During that five-hour time period from 7 to midnight, if you could get a song played on there and Alan Freed said something good about it, it was guaranteed to sell a couple hundred thousand probably before the end of the week. So, of course, to help him do that, you'd slip him a couple of simoleons, you know. You'd give him a, a record with, you know, the record would be in the little sleeve and in that sleeve it'd be a couple hundred dollars or maybe a couple of thousand dollars. And, of course, this was illegal. Because this is an illegal act called payola. When you pay a certain DJ to play your songs over other songs on the radio. See, radio stations have to give a certain amount of fairness. Okay? And, of course, getting paid to pay certain records on the air is illegal. Uh, Unfortunately for Alan Freed, he became one of the mighty that tumbled. Because once the law caught up to him, the FBI... Uh, he was arrested, he went to jail a couple of times, he bounced around, got into alcohol. He was the number one radio DJ in America in 1958. By 1962, he was dead. Uh, and it was a shame to see, but you know what? He played with fire. And of course, that was an illegal act he was doing. He knew it, but, you know, you play a dirty game. Now, as radio has survived... With the coming of television, with the expansion of television, okay, Uh, and now with, like, the internet, one of the things that's helped radio survive is, number one, automobiles. We saw from the 1970s into the 2000s, during those 30 years, a huge expansion. you got to remember that for many, and I remember this as a kid, that there would only usually be one, possibly two cars per family all over our block. Now... If you've got like a family of five, mom, dad, three kids, let's say the kids are 22, 18, and 17, well, each of those kids has their own car also. So now you've got a house on the street, five people in the house, five cars. Well, if there's one thing you can't do when you're in a car, at least you're not supposed to, is watch television or visually do something while you're driving. 
So radio is still a big deal when it comes to the automobile. Uh, now, of course, there are ways that you can get around it. You know, you can plug your aux in and that kind of thing. Uh, put in your Spotify or whatever kind of uh, anything you have on your phone. You can go ahead and play that in your car. Uh, but otherwise, you know, one of the reasons why one of the top radio stations in New York City is WINS. 10-10 wins. Traffic on the ones. And in most metropolitan areas, especially our area, those traffic reports in the morning and on the drive home are really important. So radio is still viable. The funny thing is, it wasn't until the late 1970s, early 1980s, that people started to pay attention to FM. FM had just been left alone. People thought AM was the thing. And it was for decades. And then finally people realized that the sound was better, there was better quality sound on FM stations. So they started going to frequency modulation, which was FM. So now AM started to die. See, AM, even into the early 1980s, maybe some of you saw the Howard Stern movie. Okay, even into the early 1980s, Howard Stern was at WNBC, which of course would become WFAM. They were still playing top 40 music. But by 1981, WABC, Music Radio 77, WABC, was now News Talk. Later on, of course... NBC would drop top 40 music, would go to the sports format. And this is what saved AM radio. AM radio was dying. But something happened. And it has to do with two things. Number one, WFAN and whoop. Oh, I gotta get it. Oh, my goodness. All right, hold on. There we go. And this guy right here. Okay? That's a guy by the name of Rush Limbaugh. So now, WFAN and Rush Limbaugh are what helped save AM radio. How is that? How did sports radio and conservative talk radio save AM radio? Well, it wasn't so much WFAN and Rush Limbaugh that saved AM radio... It was you. And what I mean by you, it's people. Because one of the things that is very similar to both WFAN and Rush Limbaugh's conservative talk show is that you participate. You are part of the show. Because in both formats, they are heavily laden with listener callers. So AM radio, which by the mid to late 1980s was dying, gets saved by sports talk. And of course, New York City drives the way the rest of the country goes. There were other places that had sports radio, but nobody had done it like WFAN. And of course, that was copied around the country. Same thing Rush Limbaugh is heard across the country, but his first flagship station was in New York City in 1988 when he launched his national show. Uh, and it now has like 600 and something affiliates all across the country. Um, and it's because the, the, the success of AM radio with these kind of formats is because you are part of the show. All right, that's your radio lesson. I've got your quiz there. Make sure your quiz is in by Sunday evening, 8 p.m. And on Monday, oh, television. I'm going to show you some of the highlights in the history of television. <laughs>